Uh, no, yeah, I said yes to do this plenary, uh, and I appreciate the invitation. I'm very excited to do this. Um, uh, this society is very exciting for me. I feel um, very at home in evolutionary ecology. It's it's one of my identities, the other being an anthropologist, but I, I've, I'm 100% an anthropologist and 100% an evolutionary ecologist. And so I'm, I'm very happy to speak to all of you on the topic of how we can make incremental or dramatic improvements to um, scholarship and particularly in evolution and ecology. And I know uh, probably a few of you are here because you like chickens. Uh, chickens are great. Uh, and um, I promise to talk about chickens, but first I'm gonna talk about hockey. So hockey is a peculiar North American sport. I, I assume most of you know what it is, but let me do a very rapid description. Uh, you take very large aggressive men, put them on ice skates uh, and uh, give them a very hard object to hit with very long hard sticks. And uh, then they try to um, uh, hit one another with both the uh, puck it's called, which is a hard piece of tire rubber essentially, and these sticks. Uh, there is minimal safety equipment and there are lots of injuries in this sport. And a lot of the fan base likes the aggressiveness of this sport. It's gotten more domesticated over the years, but in the, uh, there was a bunch of safety reforms in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, uh, but during that period, uh, there were no helmets worn uh, in the National Hockey League. Uh, here is a, a few stills from one of the most famous um, fights that happened on live television in 1969 between Ted Green and Wayne Mackey, where a stick fight broke out. And this happened all the time, by the way, in, in hockey at the time. It's, it's rare now. And in this particular case, um, Mackey eventually hit Green on his head with the stick and shattered his skull on live TV. It was quite dramatic, so dramatic that the tape was deleted. And all that survives uh, are these stills, which I hope are not too gruesome. I, I selected them so that they would not be. Um, this was one of the events which catalyzed the safety movement in the National Hockey League. Uh, and about a decade later, helmets became mandatory. But lots of really interesting debates about reform uh, happened in, the, in that decade. Uh, here's, a, there's a nice short history of it in uh, Schelling's uh, book, which was published in 1978, right before the helmet, helmets became mandatory. This, this is a fantastic book called Micromotives and Macro Behavior, which is all about human institutions and how they evolve and, and uh, guide human behavior. Um, so this is just a nice quote. I hope you'll indulge if I just read it for you. One player summed up the feelings of many. It's foolish not to wear a helmet, but I don't because the other guys don't. I know that's silly, but most of the players feel the same way. If the league made us do it though, we'd all wear them and nobody would mind. Uh, here's a, an image of two quite famous uh, players um, from Chicago, uh, Bobby Hulls, Dan Mitka, showing the classic uh, hockey player dental arcade. Uh, so why am I bringing up this example? You could probably guess that there's a metaphor lurking here about academia. Um, the general point about incentives that I'm gonna draw out later with some examples. Uh, but the, for now, let me just say, uh, often there are conflicts between levels when we talk about incentives and the, the incentives operating at the level of the individual, um, stop individuals from actually doing what's good for them. And here we have a case which is quite common in human institutions where the individuals recognize that and they ask for some top-down solution because they know they can't themselves fix the system. Uh, and you can probably guess why I'm mentioning that. Um, okay, another quick example. I'm gonna run through some examples here uh, playfully, but I'm gonna draw out, I think, some, some serious uh, points uh, from the collection. Uh, second example is about Protestant churches in the United States. So um, the, the Americans in the audience know for sure, and, and most of you who are not Americans probably also know that the United States is an unusually religious uh, Western democracy. And it has a very dynamic and even entertaining, uh, to put a positive spin on it, uh, uh, a uh, set of, of religious dynamics with competing churches. And it, it's very dynamic actually, uh, compared to say Western and Northern Europe where religion is, if you'll forgive me, quite boring. There's a state church, you're a member or you're not, people don't talk about it, <laughs> right? And, uh, but the United States, religion's a big deal and it's incredibly dynamic. And one of the uh, biggest changes in recent history in, in American religion has been the decline of the so-called mainline Protestant churches. Um, 
mainline Protestant churches would be the classical ones, uh, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian. Uh, as a Scottish American, I grew up in the Presbyterian church. Um, and th these churches have declined quite rapidly and is beginning in the second half of the 20th century and it's still continuing. Um, Methodist congregations, Presbyterian congregations are just emptying out. And in, at the same time, evangelical churches, Baptists, uh, Pentecostals and the like, um, have uh, increased, uh, certainly held their own as a, in this graph as a proportion of the total, uh, but they've spread uh, as the population increases. And you might ask, what accounts for this different in the difference in the fates of these two religious traditions? And one idea would be, well, the mainline churches are just losing people, so-called apostasy rates are higher, or they're worse at recruiting than the evangelical churches. And it turns out neither is true. The evangelical churches and the mainline churches are just about equally good at both losing and gaining members of the congregation. Uh, the, neither is, is better than the other, for the most part. There are small differences in some regions, but it's mainly the same. And the big difference, as documented in this great book called The Churching of America by Fink and Stark, is birth rates. Uh, the evangelical churches have grown as a proportion of American Protestant churches because they have bigger families. Members of the congregations have bigger families. And pronatalist norms are instructed at the pulpit. Preachers talk about the importance of having kids and growing the church, whereas the mainline churches tend to emphasize education and upward mobility into the middle class, which, as everybody here knows, education tends to work against starting a family early, and you end up with smaller families as a result. And this explains the vast majority of the difference in fates of these churches. And this is, it, it's not about incentive to join the church or not to leave. It's just how many kids you have. And then the kids are socialized in the church. Some of them leave the church. Some of them join, up, join other churches. But even a fairly modest difference in birth rates over decades um, can lead to the, mainly the replacement of mainline churches in many parts of the United States. So yeah, I'll draw out this lesson more later. For now, just bookmark it in your mind as incentives aren't the story here, but there's been a major cultural change in American religion. Um, so. Let me step back a moment from my playful examples and say, uh, be transparent, as it were, about what my goals are. And I think scholarship is a big tent, and we should allow lots of diversity. I mean, essentially, scholarship is kind of an anarchist uh, society. Um, but anarchies also subscribe to common um, principles and goals. And I just want to state mine. Uh, and if yours are slightly different, that's fine. I, I imagine we mainly overlap. I call these my four pillars of research. You can picture them there on the right. That's research being held up by its four pillars. Uh, the first of these is that we'd like, we'd like scholarship to be reproducible. That means we could look at an individual paper or study and actually verify that the result exists. It's not a product of an error uh, or fraud. Uh, so let's say same investigation, repeatable inference, the reproducibility standard, which is extremely important. Um, We'd also like it to be reliable. So for a new investigation, we'd like to get the expected result. So that this could be generalization to the population that the sample originally came from, or it could be transport to some new target population. Uh, but, but if we understand causal effects, generalization and transport are, are, should be possible. Um, the research should be reasoned, by which I mean, uh, we can justify the inference. So that it is one of the worst things about doing science as opposed to just living your life as an animal in, in, in a natural environment is that it's not enough just to be right about something in science. You also have to be able to justify that to your peers. Uh, so knowledge is justified true belief. It's not just true belief. And so the, the reasoning part of it, showing that results follow logically and you didn't just guess something and then show it was true empirically, that's part of the scientific endeavor. That's one of the most challenging things about it. And then finally, but certainly not least important, uh, we want our scholarship to be respectable, by which I mean ethical and open. Uh, we should do no harm uh, to our subjects and participants, uh, and we should preserve the rights of our colleagues and the public to, to reach their own conclusions about the meaning of our research. And we have an obligation to create humane, I use that term quite generally, um, uh, working conditions for scientists themselves uh, at all stages of our careers. So incentives have been a, a real focus in thinking about reforming academia and scholarship to meet those types of goals that were on the previous slide. Uh, I've talked about this myself and I work at this uh, in my own department and in the Max Planck Society actually as well. Um, 
And a lot of this means that we emphasize and educate researchers on, on the benefits of adopting open, transparent workflows. And there are real significant individual level benefits to doing the right thing, right? It's like, it's, it's this basic dilemma in life and all, all the parents in the audience will understand this because you tell your kids about this all the time. You can pay a short-term cost and get a much bigger long-term benefit, right? And, and a lot of science is like that. Use version control now, future you will thank you for the effort. Yes, it's a pain right now, but future you will be better off. And, and educating uh, the research community on those individual incentives is an important thing. And that's, that's emphasizing positive incentives. And then we want to reform negative incentives, things like the use of H index in, uh, in, in uh, promotion and hiring decisions and so on, or replace them with other kinds of incentives for transparency. Um, I think all of this is important and I support it completely. Um, but it's a very small part of the general dynamics of how the scholarly community works and how scientific beliefs evolve. And so I wanna spend the rest of the, the time uh, that I have uh, providing some examples of these other effects and stimulating your imagination about them so that we can bring this kind of broader system level analysis to the reform movement. Uh, because I, there are parts of, of um, human society that do this, like policy impact analysis. And essentially what we're doing is we're, we're trying to do niche construction of how uh, scholarship works and, and some policy, systematic policy analysis would be good. Okay, uh, quick example here that um, uh, I couldn't give a talk like this without mentioning is, is the basic fact that incentives are only one motive for behavior for humans. And there's a big social science literature on this. So there's now I'm putting on my anthropologist hat, if you'll indulge me for a moment. I'll talk about chickens. Chickens are coming. Uh, but for now, let's talk about children. And uh, imagine you ran a daycare and um, the parents are leaving uh, their kids with you while they go off to work during the day. And then they, uh, they pay you money for this. You educate their kids, uh, potty train them, all kinds of things. And then the, at the end of the day, the parents come and pick up their kids and take them home. Um, chronic problem in this sort of business is that parents are late to pick up their kids. It's not that they don't love their kids and want them. It's just that, you know, they're late. Things happen. Um, they're competing incentives and they know their kids are safe with you. So maybe that they're not in a hurry to save their kids from you, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, nevertheless, this is very costly for daycare centers. And, and there are whole uh, businesses that have sprung up just to help daycare centers deal with tardy parents. So, there's also a scholarly literature on this, and that's where I want to bring it in. It's relevant for us thinking about um, scientific reform. Uh, sometimes appealing to incentives is counterproductive. Uh, and so let me walk you very quickly. It's just one slide here on this study. Walk you very quickly through this experiment, which is now a classic in the social sciences in, in thinking about institutional design. It's this paper from 2000 called A Fine is a Price. And what they did is they did a, a randomized experiment in Israeli daycares where they selected a, a random group of, of daycare groups to um, have a fine. So every minute that a parent was late picking up their kid, they would be fined a certain amount of money. Um, previous to this, all daycares had not had fines. There was just a norm. Uh, here's when you pick up uh, your kid. And if you're a responsible parent, that's when you'll pick them up and, and so on. And then when parents would still be late, but they'd apologize. Um, so in the first five weeks, what you see on this graph on the horizontal axis is week number in the study. It's a 20-week study and, and um, average number of late arrivals. Uh, this is number of, of parents uh, on the vertical in the two groups, uh, randomized uh, groups. Uh, the, the dark trend being the groups where the fine was instituted and then the control group is the white squares. So the first five weeks, it kind of looks like the fine is working. It's not having a big effect but the, the, there's slightly uh, uh, fewer late parents in the first five weeks. But then after the fifth week, everything uh, goes wrong. And uh, uh, what happens here, and the researchers interviewed the parents about this, it's a very rich study, is um, once you make it a fine, well, that's an explicit social contract. And if the parents are willing to pay the money, well, then they can leave their kids there as long as they're willing to pay. And so you get more late parents actually, and more inconvenience for the daycare center uh, by instituting the fine. Uh, because it was no longer an ethical issue, you see. So why am I mentioning this? Well, it's a great study and everybody should know about it. Uh, it uh, effects like this have been documented in, in lots of contexts now, not just in daycares, although it's not always found. You, you have to have the ethical norm in the beginning. 
right? Uh, if, if there's no ethical norm against being late in the beginning, then the fine isn't going to be counterproductive, right? So you, you have to have some ethical norm to begin with. Um, but I, I mentioned it because it's a classic, but also because there, there are contexts within the sciences and within all human institutions that are like this, where um, it's, it's okay to appeal to people's ethics. Sometimes uh, it's just true that people have to do something that's costly to them individually because it benefits the system. And it's not wrong to appeal to that, I think. That's just my opinion, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, let's come back to hockey and churches now. And I'm going to tie these into science reform. And yeah, chickens are coming. They're coming, those of you, the chicken fans in the audience. So I think evolution ecology actually has a lot to contribute to broader discussion about the reform of academia. And that's because evolution ecology is a field that grapples with systems and uh, all the, the, the mix of forces that create system dynamics over time. This is our bread and butter. Uh, this is what we do. And um, it's not enough to understand individuals, or rather the, the, the insights in evolutionary ecology come from understanding that the properties of individuals are caused by the population and vice versa, right? There's this whole system uh, perspective that's one of the things that really attracts me to the field. So I'm gonna use the hockey and, and the Protestant churches examples is just, memory placeholders for you to talk about two broad categories of, of um, forces that are related to incentives, but are not part of the traditional discussion of incentives, but are, are arguably big deals in the science. In, in science. Uh, the first is, is structural incentives, that is um, uh, how the structure of, of the society uh, creates uh, incentive-like forces on human behavior, even if individuals aren't aware of those incentives. So we wouldn't traditionally call them incentives because the, the, the usual definition of the word incentive is it's something that's consciously, there's conscious awareness and deliberate adjustment, uh, but nevertheless, it, it has a, a big effect on individuals. And then the second is, is population dynamics uh, broadly. So demography and development are forces that can compete with individual, uh, individuals adjusting their behavior to meet incentives and can even overwhelm those. Um, uh, incentives. So let me uh, run through now, uh, chickens are coming, uh, three playful examples, which I think have nevertheless uh, serious uh, ideas embedded in them. And the first is to talk about chickens as an example of, of structure, the imp impact of structure. Um, then I use a feral sheep, uh, uh, talk about demographic forces more broadly. And this will slide um, quite rapidly into talking about kittiwakes and the impact of luck in, in uh, populations where there are really strong survival bottlenecks like kittiwakes and academics. Um, so I've, I've previously done some work on this uh, with, with Paul Smaldino. Uh, this paper we published, um, now I forget when, 2016 or so. Uh, uh, called The Natural Selection of Bad Science. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time discussing this because I've already published it. Uh, just to put it here in case you haven't read it, um, if, you, if you are interested in reading it and, and wanna uh, ask me some questions about it later, I, I'm very interested in your views. Uh, the basic idea of, of this paper is to highlight what I think is a general um, phenomenon in, in human institutions, but especially in academia is that a lot of the bad behavior in academia is not deliberately bad. Individuals aren't cheating consciously, but nevertheless, they, they have behavior which undermines the scientific project. And the forces that have created that behavior are due to the incentives, but the incentives aren't consciously held, they're structural. So here's the 32nd version of this argument. Uh, many questionable research practices, that's what QRP means, um, are in fact normative in scientific communities. People were taught them by their peers and their advisors, they're reinforced by journals. And what these things tend to do is create results, right? Often false results, but they create results. And, and uh, you know, p-hacking and, and outlier dropping and hypothesizing after results are known and, and all manner of other things. Um, people were instructed to do these things, and you can find uh, articles in which um, prestigious uh, uh, professors advise their junior colleagues to do these things. They're not hiding it, right? They, they'd say it because they think it discovers the truth. This is what they believe. Um, so in a sense, there's a, they're not aware uh, that the incentives are selecting for these questionable practices. And then peer review and promotion review and such um, um, 
leads to more success for uh, individuals and teams that practice these things. And that has made them normative, despite the fact that statisticians, for example, have been complaining for almost 100 years now about p-hacking. <laughs> Every decade, the American Statistical Association publishes another, please don't use p-values like this paper. And it just has no effect uh, because the, the, the selection going on in the sciences is very powerful, I think. Anyway, this is, this is the, the structure of the argument. It's not that this is always true, but I, I think it's an important dynamic. Um, now I'm gonna talk about chickens. And here's another important dynamic that is also a, a consequence of structural incentives and what I mean by that is the level at which awards are applied. So um, probably not many people here have, have kept chickens. Uh, when I was in Davis, there were we were allowed to have chickens in town, and so lots of lots of people had had chickens in their, uh, running around their houses laying eggs for them. And, and chickens are great, uh, actually. They're they're very affectionate animals. Um, uh, but not all chickens are affectionate. Some of them are cannibals, and this has been. Uh, persistent problem in, in fowl domestication is aggressive behavior between chickens and cannibalism. They eat one another's eggs, they eat one another's feathers. Sometimes in, in um, strong cases, they'll peck one another to death. And so one of the ways that this was um, uh, traditionally managed and is still managed in some parts of the world is by uh, beak trimming. So on the left here, you see what a chicken's beak should look like. Uh, it's pointed. And, uh, and then on the right, you see a, a chicken that's had its beak trimmed. And so this makes it very difficult for it to uh, peck aggressively uh, other individuals or, or eat feathers off, off uh, the other hens. And uh, so this is a way of managing the aggressive behavior. Um, but starting in the 80s, uh, uh, in, in the Midwest of the US, I think, um, this uh, revolution began of changing how uh, hens are selected to breed out the aggressiveness so that they didn't have to trim their beaks. Trimming beaks is bad for the birds. It makes it hard for them to eat and it can cause lots of secondary infections. They can, really can't close their mouths. Uh, sometimes they have trouble drinking. So um, uh, here's a classic paper from 1996 on the group selection for adaptation in, in multiple hen cages. So the historical background is it's it's very economically expensive to house hens individually. And so they're, they're housed in groups. And, um, but traditional animal breeding is you'll, you'll select the most productive hens, uh, the ones that produce the most eggs. And those are the ones that you selectively breed uh, for the next generation. And what this does is it favors cannibal hens uh, because the, the, if you're the first cannibal, you're more productive than um, your colleagues, let's call them in the hen house. Uh, in the chicken coop. Um, the real innovation here is to select the whole coop as a whole and instead favor um, uh, family lines, which have the highest average productivity. And this disfavors cannibalism. So again, here, the, the effect sizes here I've, I've highlighted in the parts that I haven't blurred out are really extraordinary. You go from um, mortality going from 68% to 8.8%. Um, uh, day survived from 169 to 348, uh, eggs per hen per day from 52% uh, to 68%, eggs per hen housed from 91 to 237, and egg mass from 5.1 to 13.4 kilograms. There's no trade-off, right? It's, it's this incredible effect where uh, the whole system is way more productive, but you have to apply the incentive at the group level so that you get traits which are group cohabitating compatible. Um, of course, this is evolutionary biologists understand group selection, right? We, 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 we all study it in our intro classes and we know about multi-level selection now. And there's this uh, uh, very productive uh, formal framework for understanding how it works. And when you do um, artificial selection, of course, you, you basically play in God and you can control uh, which parts of the multi-level decomposition are most important to selection. And so that's what happens in the chicken coop is you select the uh, the group level instead of the individual level. So just the cartoon version, very quickly, um, the change in, uh, this is the so-called price equation, the multi-level price equation, the change in any trait, uh, P, uh, in this case, cannibalism in a generation can be decomposed to the within and between group effects. The between group effect is exactly the covariance between the trait, your cannibalism, and uh, group productivity, group fitness, that is the average fitness of members of the group. Um, and the within group effect is the average covariance between cannibalism and fitness within groups. 
Uh, and so the important thing to realize is for an antisocial trait like cannibalism, um, it is disfavored by the between group component because cannibal groups do worse than non-cannibal groups. Yeah, uh, they survive less, they lay fewer eggs, et cetera. Um, but if you're the first cannibal in a group, you're better off. And that's why the within group effect favors cannibalism. And so the artificial selection uh, idea is to emphasize the between group part by selecting whole chicken coops. Okay. I want to playfully suggest, well, maybe not playfully, perhaps seriously, that uh, chickens and researchers have a lot in common in this regard. Uh, we work in groups. Uh, uh, we must compete, uh, but we also must cooperate to get our work done. But the scale at which that competition and cooperation happens has dramatically different effects on the phenotypes of the individuals. And now, of course, in the chickens, we're talking about genetically inherited phenotypes. And that's not what I'm talking about in the case of students. I'm talking about uh, culturally uh, taught traditions and individual strategic adjustments uh, that are responses to the structure and the structure which level um, rewards and punishments are applied at. Um, and so, uh, we can think about uh, uh, these structural effects in science as being unintended consequences of the clumsy application of individual incentives uh, for um, hiring and promotion and publication and, and grants and so on. Uh, that is that in, in many parts of academia, not all, but in many, there's an overemphasis on short-term individual evaluation. And this favors, air quotes, uh, cannibalism. Uh, and of course, all simultaneously limit scientific progress. And this is by analogy to the chicken coop. Uh, the chickens all end up worse off because of cannibalism. It, the system does not win, uh, even though the trait can spread because um, the individual dynamics uh, allow it to. And this, again, evolutionary ecologists understand effects like this. This is a standard thing. Natural selection does not necessarily, or even on average, produce benefits uh, for the population. Um, so in the context of academia, um, I've been an academic for about 30 years now, and uh, I could tell stories. Uh, since this is being recorded, I'm not going to. <laughs> but if we were in a live conference, I would say, buy me some beers later and I'll spill some tea. So when uh, uh, sortie is held in person at some point, uh, uh, the offers will stand. Um, I will tell you all some stories off camera. But uh, uh, we all know that they're, they're bad actors. There are also lots of good actors in science, but they're bad actors. There's uh, these individual incentives um, can favor bullying, manipulation, exploitation, and even theft of data and materials uh, at times. And I've, I've personally known, been adjacent to all of these things. And, um, and yes, it's shameful behavior and none of it is normative, but people get ahead through this. And sometimes these, these strategies are actually taught. Um, and again, I've, I, hesitant to tell stories here, but again, uh, some other time I'll, I'll tell uh, some of you some stories. Um, and of course, the, the counter response to this is there are informal networks of gossip that, that arises resistance. And I'm part of a number of informal networks, uh, as are I'm sure many of you, and we, we do our best to work against this, but we're fighting an entire system where people get jobs and even Nobel prizes in some case, uh, uh, some cases uh, because of this bad behavior. And, um, um, I'm just describing the situation, but I think I think the scale at which rewards are applied is a big part of this. Is that uh, individuals, uh, uh, you know, the, the the sort of stereotypical big men of science uh, reward system um, uh, favors this actually, and uh, giving some thought to reform um, about sliding scales and rewarding whole teams uh, and units is is um, important. That said. Uh, there's no result in a system in which individuals don't compete. It's just a question of what level we want the competition to be at and what form we want it to take. And that said, if, if once you start rewarding teams, you also can get different kinds of, of behavior within teams. That's also not so nice because now if someone in your team is, is not doing their work, it affects you materially and that can lead to other kinds of problems. And so I'm not saying that there's any kind of uh, happy um, um, all ponies and rainbows uh, world out there. Uh, but I think we can make marginal improvements. Um, okay, next metaphor. Uh, uh, science is, is like a chicken coop. It's also like a flock of feral sheep. Um, and uh, what I have in mind here is this famous, uh, well, it's famous to me. I assume a lot of you know about it. It deserves to be very famous. A study of the, the soy sheep uh, from St. Kilda, uh, 
the St. Kilda Islands. And these are, are sheep that are, they're not even a flock because no one manages them. They, they live free with dignity, right? <laughs> Unlike ordinary sheep. And uh, uh, there's a, a long-term ecological study of the individuals in which they're measured, their whole life histories and, and their mortality and births are, are uh, recorded and, and as are the ecological conditions. And this is a this is a modern classic. Uh, these sorts of long-term studies are some of the most important kind of work that uh, we can do um, because you can't study evolution unless you've got the long-term data, right? The forces on an individual generational span can be very weak, but they can create big changes in the long-term. So this is a really important um, uh, study. And uh, I wanna highlight this, this one sort of uh, paradox that has arisen from it is that the, the sheep are shrinking. Um, and fairly rapidly. So what you see here in the plots on the right are, are lamb sizes and adult sizes in uh, different years in, in kilograms. And you'll see that while there's fluctuations, um, there's been uh, a loss of uh, you know, about three kilograms for lambs uh, uh, since the 1980s, uh, or, or, or for people my age, we say since the Cold War. And uh, uh, adults have, have, got, have lost about the same amount of weight. Uh, this has uh, uh, happened despite the fact that it's easy to show that larger individuals survive better. There's positive natural selection for being large, for larger body size in this population. Um, so why is the population getting smaller? And the answer is complicated. I'm going to give you the cartoon version of this um, because I want to get on to the, the academic uh, discussion part. But um, a large part of the downward trend is due to earlier births and, this, and, and changes in population regulation. So uh, mothers are having their lambs um, uh, earlier and then their daughters uh, uh, are having even smaller lambs as a result because they're, they're giving birth earlier and earlier and there's a nonlinear compensatory effect in the size of lambs for, for young mothers in this, uh, in this population. Um, but lots of things are, are influencing uh, uh, phenotypic change, and most of them are more powerful than selection. In the very long run, selection uh, will in increase body size to some extent, but the population is going to reach an equilibrium where selection doesn't get its way because it can't remove these developmental uh, effects and the effects of population regulation. So th the quantitative version of this argument, and this is important because if we're going to be serious about policy analysis, we need some logical framework to, to analyze policy in, is the, the age-structured version of the price equation. I'm not going to spend uh, uh, really any time on this slide at all. I just want to uh, fold out the terms of this for you. So you take that previous price equation that came up with the chickens, and in an age-structured population, you've got a bunch of new effects that affect phenotypic change that have to do with demography. So like aging, uh, just because individuals move from one age class to another, this changes the phenotype. There's selection on survival. There's individual plasticity. And there's a bunch of additional terms that have to do with heritability and how that works. And it's, and it's mediated by the environment, trade-offs between fertility and size, and selection on fecundity. And the really wonderful thing about this framework is it's complete. It's axiomatic complete. Uh, this equation contains all of the forces of demographic change. And so if you can measure any part of this, you can compare its relative power to the other parts. And you know you haven't missed anything that's changing the population. And so this is a major scientific achievement to have a framework like this. Very few sciences get something like this that's axiomatically true. Um, so in this particular case, as I mentioned before, uh, the big thing that's driving down um, body size on the ecological time scale is this offspring mother difference. Mothers are giving birth to even smaller daughters who have even smaller uh, daughters themselves. And this is having a, a big effect, all right? And in the long run, the body size equilibrium is gonna be some trade-off between this developmental and population regulation effect and what selection wants. Um, okay, so that's sheep. And I, I hope you like feral sheep just in and of themselves because that's a fascinating study about how phenotypes change on ecological timescales and, and how selection is not the whole story. Um, in the social sciences, there's a whole bunch of similar issues uh, to be appreciated in thinking about institutional change and the rates that it happens at. Um, so here's a, a nice textbook on the topic uh, by Colin Kammerer, who's in a, a behavioral economist at Caltech. And uh, so he, here's just one example from the book, but there's a bunch like this. Um, the, the Stephen Jay Gould, actually, which is why I chose this one, cited this example in 1985. Uh, argues that baseball, which is this very weird American sport, uh, maybe some of you have heard of it, 
Yeah, it's mainly people drinking beer and swinging sticks. Uh, batting averages converged in the 20th century because of dynamic adjustments in field pitching and hitting. Uh, some economists described this as an encouraging tale drawn from real life of how players learn to play equilibrium strategies. And you can think of equilibrium strategies here as where the incentives uh, will nudge individuals to. Uh, but the point that Kammerer makes over and over again in this book is that these incentives can operate very slowly in human societies because people have to learn the equilibrium and they're often not consciously aware of the incentives influencing them. In the case of baseball, it was the order of decades. So I bring this up. Uh, the reforms that we uh, apply, uh, there are two things to say. Uh, the first is that they may have very slow effects given some realistic demographic model of how academia works. And maybe that's just what we have to accept. The second thing would be to say, maybe we wanna strategize about ways to make more rapid change by taking seriously that the population has to learn um, the equilibrium. Uh, so, Again, this is a, a talk about the price equation now for some reason, but uh, there's a cultural version of the price equation. Uh, uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Brett Beheim and Ryan Baldini, have a paper from 2012 on this where they analyze changes in religious traditions in North America using a demographic decomposition composition of cultural change uh, as norms for fertility. Uh, the mainline Protestants versus evangelicals example. And this is the same price equation. Here it looks different, but it's the same decomposition. There's fertility, there's differences between parents and offspring, there's mortality, there's immigration. This is now an open population, unlike the sheep. So there's immigration and immigration. And all these things cause changes in people's beliefs and family sizes. And when we have a de longitudinal data set, we can do the decomposition and show which forces dominate. And so they analyzed this uh, church case and showed that indeed it's, it's, uh, it's not hard for small differences in fertility over the long run to lead to one church type to replace another. Um, when we analyze academia now, and I, I promise I'm getting to the end of the talk, uh, when we analyze academia, we need a model, a bespoke model uh, of academia. And, um, uh, I'm going to give you a cartoonish version to spur your imagination here of what I mean. And, and uh, the goal here is to have a life history analysis of, of academic uh, so that I can draw out these structural forces and how they can swamp incentives or make, make the influence of incentives very slow in ecological time, so to speak. So here's in classic life history uh, style diagram. Here's the life history of an academic. Uh, so we start out as students, S. And then some of us survived to be doctors, D, and then some doctors survived to be professors, P. And then professors reproduced by uh, creating students, not literally physically reproduced, but you know what I mean. There's a cultural reproduction uh, that goes on. Um, and of course, there's lots of details I'm leaving out here, but this is, this is an imagination exercise, right? Um, also in these systems, resources matter a lot. So there are students with stipends, for example, or with research budgets, and um, uh, students with stipends and research budgets may have a, a, a quite different probability of, of surviving to become a doctor than those who don't. And the same holds for the other states in the system. There are doctors with resources, with grants, and uh, they can, uh, this can dramatically affect their probabilities of becoming professors. And professors with money uh, uh, may uh, produce different students uh, or more students, um, reproduce their ideas, uh, publish more, have a bigger impact on scientific beliefs uh, than others. And, uh, and of course, at the same time, individuals are exiting the system because there's a world outside of academia, you may have heard, and it's, there are many nice things about it. And a uh, number of my students have gone on to quite happy lives outside of academia, and I've completely supported them in that. And um, I myself am very happy in academia, but uh, uh, there are exits. <laughs> and, uh, and those exits have a big effect on regulating the system too, because, um, well, obviously, uh, often a professor has to retire before a doctor can become a professor. But it also on the other end for students, um, some people can't become students uh, if professors already have students, right? There are limits uh, on these population limits in, in different parts of the system. Um, so when, when uh, uh, we, the people do policy analysis of different systems, they use diagrams like this and try to think it through. In the Max Planck Society, for example, we're trying to create a tenure track system at the institutes, which doesn't traditionally exist. And we have flow diagrams like this, where we're trying to figure out um, how many people can you push through such a system given, re given retirement rates and the sizes of budgets and so on to have a really responsible demographic analysis of how such a program might work. 
Um, and what you, what you can do, though, just purely intellectually, without analyzing any particular policies, just try to understand how these systems behave in general. And this is the general thing about complex systems analysis, which is big in evolution ecology, is you do thought experiments with these simple models to say you delete some arrows and make some others more important and observe how the system evolves. And this help gives you intuitions uh, from the simple systems that you can apply to real world cases. And this is also, by the way, why, why I encourage you to think about chickens and feral sheep is because even though uh, researchers aren't exactly like those things, in complex systems, you have to take isolated lessons from, the, from, from analogy uh, to draw your attention uh, to your particular system. And then you'll do the bespoke analysis on your system, but you get it, you're, you become aware of, of these sorts of dynamics by studying general systems. Um, on top of this demography, of course, is the evolution of scientific beliefs itself, which I'm only, this is the only slide I have on that. Um, uh, Paul and I have a paper from 2015 in which we try to model the influence of publication bias on the cycle of investigation and hypothesis formation. And uh, this is a very cartoonish model, um, but it, it was just, there was, there's very little literature on this actually, even though it's such an important determinant of how our beliefs form and, and which theories float to the top or sink to the bottom. Um, okay, I'm conscious of the time and I'm gonna be done here. Uh, so uh, there's this saying in the social sciences that demography is destiny. And, um, uh, and, and it's, it's a deliberate exaggeration. Obviously it's not destiny. It's just say demographic forces are incredibly powerful. And, um, and if you're unaware of them, you can be badly surprised. And academia is a system with many bottlenecks in sequence. And those bottlenecks create powerful demographic forces. And uh, we need to think about that just as hard as we think about explicit incentives because they transform the population and our beliefs in powerful ways. And um, so just some quick examples to, to stimulate your imagination. In a rapidly growing field, it can be very hard to police uh, the research that's going on because there's just too much bullshit being produced at too high a rate. I'm not gonna name any fields, but take your favorite example. Um, this, this selects for or favors rapid training as transitions from student to doctor because that gets you into slots. And so any research tradition which, which uh, graduates its students rapidly will have a, a head up in this, in this rapidly growing field. And as a consequence, scientific beliefs can experience lots of drift because the effective population size can be very small and also draft in the, in the sense of genetic draft, which is hitchhiking. Here it's cultural. Cultural hitchhiking is when there's some arbitrary tradition or statistical procedure or way of measuring something that becomes common just because of who started the field. And again, I'm not gonna name any fields, but I'm sure you can pick your favorite example. This is, I think this sort of thing is really common in the sciences and we should do something about it because it's bad. Um, okay, in shrinking or stable fields, you have other dynamics, which are all, also very powerful. If you have very slow replacement of professors, this dramatically changes how all the competition works. Uh, it favors, uh, 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 you, you necessarily get a slower transition from doctors to professors. This means you need ways for individuals to, to have happy, uh, productive lives uh, when they don't have secure employment. And this is a major struggle, especially in Germany uh, right now. This is a big struggle. Okay, last two things and then I'll end the talk. I wanna give you two examples of, of effects of bottlenecks that are, I think, not as intuitive as the other things I've mentioned. And so I wanna mention them before I end. And the first is there's this very powerful thing that happens in almost all bottlenecks, all, all strong selection scenarios, which is called the selection of distortion effect. And it's well understood by statisticians, but in my experience, uh, scientists have not heard of it. Uh, and the second is that uh, bottlenecks uh, make luck the most powerful force inside a system. So uh, here's a paper that was published uh, just this year in, in one of the magazines, I don't know, Science and Nature, I forget which one, um, looking at findings uh, that were later replicated or not and asking uh, up until that replication attempt happened, uh, how well cited the result was. So if you just look at panel A, for example, these were studies that were published in Nature and Science. The black trend are findings that were later not replicated. The vertical axis is citation rate, yearly citation count, and the, the horizontal axis is year. And the blue trend are findings published in the same journals that were later replicated. And as you can see, and this is also found in economics and in psychology, um, findings that were later not replicated were cited more before the replication attempt failed. Yeah, 
Uh, okay, so this one impression you might get from this is that there's two kinds of science going on here. There, there are people who are doing their QRPs and p-hacking and going for the glamorous nature science pub, and those that's the black trend, and those are unreliable results. And then there are the, the, the good drones, right? Uh, people like me who publish sl more slowly and try to get everything right and, and put everything on GitHub and so on, and, and we want to be the blue trend, right? Now, we don't get published in nature and science nearly as often, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> but uh, we want to be the blue trend. Um, and that may be true, but I think a lot of this is just the selection distortion effect that comes from peer review. So bear with me very quickly for, a, for an example. So uh, this is an example that's in my uh, textbook, by the way, on page 162, and I give the code to reproduce this uh, thought experiment. Imagine there's 200 papers or grant proposals. The, the example works uh, fine for, for either, in which there's no correlation between two features of this, of this work. And the first is on the horizontal axis, newsworthiness. Uh, what I mean by newsworthiness is, um, uh, the potential broader impact of the work, how excited other scientists and the public would get about it, um, uh, uh, the press uh, sensation uh, aspect of the work. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we want science that has impact, right? So newsworthiness is not a bad thing. Some science is newsworthy, some science isn't, um, uh, uh, and, and there's no judgment either way. It's just a different aspect. Uh, society often cares about newsworthiness, though. Um, and then there's the other axis, which is trustworthiness, which is the reliability or any of the R's uh, from my list earlier, reliability, reproducibility. So now imagine um, we create some composite score, subjective score, which is some additive combination of these two axes. And then we select the top 10%, uh, as I've done here in red. Uh, now, a, a consequence of this type of selection in any kind of system, and again, this is a called a widely appreciated effect in statistics is that this induces a negative correlation between the features post-selection. That is, selection distorts the associations among the features, and often very powerfully so. And the, and the, the more intense the bottleneck, that is, the smaller number of, of items that are selected, here proposals or papers, or candidates in the case of jobs, the more intense the distortion. So post-selection in this example, you get a correlation of minus 0.77. And again, the code to reproduce this is in the book. You can, you can run it a bunch of times and verify that I'm not, I haven't picked exactly the example that shows the effect I want. Um, uh, so the, the point here is that all of the bottlenecks, whether it's hiring or grant review or publication will distort correlations like this and create these negative correlations between things like how trustworthy work is and how much attention it gets. But it's not necessarily a consequence of cheating, but it is something we still wanna deal with. And, and I hope that point comes across. Um, last example, uh, I promise, uh, kitty wakes. So Robin Snyder is one of my favorite uh, theoretical biologists and she has a pair of really nice papers with her colleagues on the uh, decomposing and quantifying the roles of luck and pluck uh, so this is stochastic effects and quality effects in um, ecological dynamics. And uh, uh, these are great papers. I, I really encourage you to take a look at them. Even if you don't want to go through the math, there's lots of really, they're really well written. Robin always writes really well. And so uh, here's from this paper that came out this year, Time and Chance, uh, where they, they take a number of, of data sets and they do the decomposition to look at the importance at, at different ages of luck, that is just being lucky enough to make it to the next life history stage versus quality differences on uh, lifetime reproductive success in, in natural breeding populations. So here's just one of the examples from, from kittiwakes. Um, I think these are black-footed kittiwakes. And uh, the graph, what you're seeing is age. Um, kittiwakes can live a really long time, like lots of birds, right? Most of them don't though. Um, and then the vertical axis is the contribution uh, to the variance in lifetime reproductive success of the black trend is luck. And this is the ability that is who survives. And then the red trend is quality. And what you're seeing here is that the, the life history of these birds is dominated by stochastic effects unrelated to their phenotypes. And that's because it's very hard to survive past like age five or seven. And uh, in life histories like this, which are quite common, um, uh, selection has an effect in the long term, but it's incredibly weak. And uh, uh, so we understand these systems as being mainly determined by luck. And I think uh, academia is unfortunately structured like kittiwakes, 
uh, you, you've got uh, big populations with very intense sequential bottlenecks. And those bottlenecks are, I'm sorry to say, often regulated by things other than quality differences. Uh, here's the one Lord of the Rings joke for Karina. Um, so, uh, and this applies both to researchers and our theories, right? That we, we pass through a lot of tight bottlenecks in promotion, funding, and citation. There's competition for attention and for the money that will generate the work in the first place. And lots of things, it's not that quality has no effect on this competition, but such a small number of individuals and ideas can make it through the bottlenecks and lots of other things like network effects, who you know, which school you went to, um, your cultural background, all of these inequalities and forms of passive and structural discrimination can have huge effects on the system. And I call these things luck. Uh, this is a bit of a euphemism, right? Of course, it's a deterministic universe. Uh, but what, what I mean by that is it's not the stuff that we want the system to, to select for. And I think this is a big, uh, almost moral crisis in, in the structure of these systems. And I'm not saying everybody can get promoted, but I'm saying we should, we should work hard to uh, uh, govern these bottlenecks so that they, they produce what we want them to produce and not produce massive distortions. Okay. Let me, let me close. I know that there's been a ton of stuff and I've spoken really quickly and I've spent the last hour talking here and, um, uh, and we need to socialize some more. So uh, I've give, given some examples about hockey players and chickens and churches and sheep and, and drawn connection to researchers. And all of this stuff I think is, is super relevant to ongoing debates. Uh, the science reform movement is hot now and, and every country's talking about it. Um, I get emails from the US government asking me to be on panels about, about scientific responsibility. And, and in Germany, there's this big discussion, which I, I put on the slide here right now about uh, German employ employment law and how it, it creates uh, uh, precarious uh, uh, conditions for junior researchers. And unfortunately, the government defends it. And this has become a very hot topic now, and maybe the law will get repealed. But uh, currently, this is, this is something that uh, the ideas in this talk speak directly to. Um, uh, where, we, where the legal system creates competition uh, actually distorts the kind of research we get. And um, uh, Saying things are hard sometimes can seem like a defense of the status quo. So I wanna conclude by saying that's not my goal at all. Um, small changes may be expected to have very small effects and take decades to filter through the system because of the roles of bottlenecks and uh, the long life histories of academics and, and uh, legal systems. Um, but some big changes that are quite accessible to us, I think, are really worth it. So I just wanna highlight this paper from Heeson and Bright, uh, is peer review a good idea? And they conclude no. Um, it's a really good paper, and I just wanted to suggest that you take a look uh, at it. Um, okay, let's stop here. Uh, where do we go? So I'm, what I'm calling for is serious analysis of policy suggestions, and uh, not just to say we share an ideology about how we want things to be, and we should adopt incentives that support that ideology. That's, that's good, but um, getting there from here could be quite hard, and it may take a very long time. That is, we're trying to construct a niche uh, for good science to happen in. Uh, a productive uh, avenue, of course, is to do the science and technology studies approach and to study reform movements in other places and try to see which lessons can be applied uh, for us. Uh, and there are successful reform movements. Laboratory protocols in the 20th century especially um, uh, were dramatically revised. And now many laboratories use these uh, laboratory information management systems, LIMS systems, which are a form of version control and data management, uh, which is very successful. And of course, software development. Um, there was a revolution in the late 20th century in, in organizing teamwork in software. Um, you can think of it as the GitHub revolution, right? The Git revolution. And then your idea, obviously, uh, 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 the people listening here are the future of the field, uh, and your ideas are the most important. Oh, yeah, so pipetting by mouth. I should say there was a joke on this slide, pipetting by mouth. People used to pipette by mouth. Uh, do not do this. <laughs> this is a very bad idea. Um, much of the activity that goes on in scientific research outside of laboratories or in laboratories is the metaphorical equivalent of pipetting by mouth, and we want to move our culture away from those things. Okay, uh, thank you for your indulgence uh, for a very weird talk. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, there's another weird talk called Science is Amateur Software Development that you can find on YouTube, just Google it. And uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'd uh, love to hear what you